All right, we're back. And Jonathan here. Do a little JavaScript. I don't think we've done any JavaScript today, have we? I don't think so. It's good. It's time. Time. It's time. Talk JavaScript. <laughs> Every Laravel developer's favorite topic. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, take it away. Sounds good, Ian. Thank you. All right, share my screen here. Yep, you're good. Good to go? Yep. Money. Hi, everyone. I hope you've all been having an awesome day so far. It's really great to be back at a, another Lair Con, and uh, especially great when I can be back and talk about my favorite topic to talk about, and that is Inertia JS. So it's good to be here. Uh, some of you may remember that I actually gave a talk on Inertia last year at LairCon as well. That was a bit more of an introductory talk. Today's talk is going to be a little bit more advanced. It's, uh, I'm going to be digging into two new features of Inertia that I'm super excited about, one of those being server-side rendering, SSR. And the other one's being the new modal or dialogue feature that we've been working on. I'm also going to talk briefly about the form helper as well. Uh, so it is a bit more of an advanced talk. So if you're not super familiar with Inertia or Vue, I recommend checking out that past talk. It's on the uh, Laracon site under past videos. And I think on the second or third page, you'll find my talk, kind of my intro talk on Inertia there. But yeah, today's going to be a, a little bit more hardcore. So I hope that's okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's dig in. So before I get too deep into the two new features, I did want to talk just briefly about a feature that we added at the end of last year, and that's called the form helper. And the form helper is essentially, um, it was actually code that Taylor Otwell wrote originally. Uh, I forget the project he created it for, but it was a, a pattern that he came up with that then got uh, moved over to uh, the Jetstream library, and then from the Jetstream library, at least the, uh, the inertia version of the Jetstream library. And from then it got moved out of there and put into Inertia Core. And it's just this really, really help helpful little tool that I use all the time with uh, my Inertia apps that just makes working with forms a little bit easier. It's basically just reduces the amount of boilerplate that's needed when creating forms uh, in an Inertia app. So I'll give you a few just quick examples here. So one of them is, the, and I got to figure out how to hide this silly little window. Sorry, the uh, Zoom window's in my way. I can't see what I'm doing, but here we go. All right. So form.processing is one of um, processing right here. Actually, I think there's a better example up here. Um, yeah. So form.processing. So you get this form object for each one of your forms and you can like, there's a bunch of properties and a bunch of methods that you can use on it. So form.processing just keeps track of whether or not your form is currently submitting or not. So you can use that to do things like disable a certain button, like a login button or a submit button, sorry, uh, to prevent double form submissions. Uh, another thing that we added somewhat more recently is an is dirty flag. So this is helpful. It basically just checks to say, if there's any form changes, uh, you can say, throw up a message to the user to say, hey, there's unsaved form changes. And that way you can say, you know, just let the users know that there's, there's changes that they need to save yet. It's kind of just a, a helpful thing that you may see in certain apps that do that. It's really easy to do with the form helper. Uh, there is form.errors as well. So that gives you quick access to your errors. There's form.progress. So if you're uploading files, you can show like a progress indicator and kind of like, you know, as it progresses during the upload, also related to form uploads or uh, file uploads, you have the form cancel method. So if you want to cancel a file upload, that's easy to do. Uh, and there's just a whole bunch of things like that, that just make working with forms just a whole lot easier. So uh, this is this, the form helper exists in the view adapter in the react adapter and in the Svelte adapters. So if you've been working with inertia and you haven't messed around with the form helper and you work with forms quite a bit, I definitely recommend giving it a try just because it's, it just, it just makes it a lot nicer. Okay. That's a form helper. Didn't want to spend too much time on that because we don't have a ton of time and I want to get to the big topics. And the first one of those is server-side rendering. So SSR. So this is the big project that we've been working on this year, in particular, kind of the earlier months of this year. And, and this came out in early access in, I believe, June, and it's been in early access since then. And uh, so there's been a bunch of people using it and it works really great. 
uh, and we're getting close to making it publicly available. So I'm excited for that. Uh, and I just want to take you know a bit of time here to kind of just explain what the point of server-side rendering and inertia app is and kind of how you do it and all that good stuff. So the thing to remember is when you're building an inertia app, and I'm going to jump over to the ping CRM demo app that we use to kind of illustrate how inertia works. The thing to remember when you're building an inertia app is that your entire front end, all your templates, all your views, they're all written in JavaScript. So they're either view templates or React templates or Svelte templates. And that's great because you have the full power of JavaScript at your disposal and you can do whatever you want, drop downs, uh, cool form validation stuff, all sorts of interesting things that are possible when using these modern uh, uh, client side frameworks. And uh, yeah, so that's like, the, you know, the whole reason why we even build inertia apps because we like building applications that way and you get that single page app experience and, and that's all great. However, it does come with one unfortunate sort of trade or side effect or trade trade off. And that is that everything is rendered, all your HTML is all rendered in the browser. Meaning if we were to look at the source here, we can see that what we're getting back here is just the root template that we have in Inertia. And there's no rendered HTML in here. It's, we get the Inertia page object, but that's it. It's an empty div, right? So we're not seeing any of this rendered HTML. Or if we go to the organizations page, there's a whole bunch of rendered HTML here. But if we look in here, it's the same thing. We get that inertia page object that has the data that we need that inertia uses to actually render the page, but there's no HTML rendered here. So why does that matter? And in a lot of cases, it actually doesn't matter. You know, inertia exists without this feature or has existed without this feature for a long time. And, and so in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter. But what it does when it does matter is in situations where you're building an application or a website that has search engine optimizations con concerns. So you want a search engine to be able to read the content of your website. And while to like while search engines like Google are great, uh, are actually pretty good at reading JavaScript based content, they actually will run and execute your JavaScript, you know, as they index your site. I think if your business relied on search engine optimization, I would be, I'd, I'd personally want a server side rendered application. And I, I, I would be nervous trusting that JavaScript was executing properly in the Google bot, for instance. So that's like the one big consideration. The other consideration and the other really nice benefit of server side rendering uh, your content is that it can improve the time or it can improve the first contentful paint as uh, I found that definition on some of Google's documentation. And that basically just means it can improve the amount of time that it takes for this UI here that we're seeing to actually render for the user. And that makes sense, right? Because if we're getting a fully, uh, all the HTML coming, all server-side rendered back to us, when the second that page loads, that HTML is all there and the server can render it. It doesn't have to wait for the JavaScript to download and then uh, parse and then run and then you know actually update the page. So it can improve the amount of time that it takes to show the first page on the first page visit. So those are sort of the two big benefits and the reason why I wanted to explore this feature to begin with. So you might be wondering like, how exactly does this work? How can we get a fully JavaScript based application to server side render all within a Laravel application? And you probably won't be surprised if I told you, you do that using Node.js. Let me show you how it works. Let's jump over to the editor and you'll see that we got just sort of just a standard Laravel application here. And we have this resources directory, right? And we have our app.js file. So this is just stock Laravel. It ships with an app.js file. And you can see here, we have this app.js file configured for inertia. And we have it set up to uh, run as a view three application. So this is like nothing really new or surprising. This is what runs in the browser. When the JavaScript downloads, this gets executed by the browser. Where it gets more interesting is this ssr.js file. So the ssr.js file is a new thing that we've added in order to make SSR work with inertia. And it's essentially the same thing as the app.js file, except it's designed to run in Node. So this is the browser version and this is the Node version. And you see here that we have this create inertia app method that we use to set up inertia. Well, the same method gets called in this function, in this file, create inertia app. And the settings are slightly different because it's optimized for node, but it's essentially the same process. We're just configuring inertia for each of one of those individual uh, um, set, uh, setups. 
And then the rest of this file, so it's about 40 lines long, is really just a bunch of boilerplate that we use to create a little web server using Node. So the way that this works is this little script right here runs as a little uh, background web server process that our Laravel app is then able to communicate with. All right, so um, let me just maybe illustrate that a little bit better. Let's go to the organizations controller here and let's go down to this index method. And that is for the organizations slash index page component, which is the page component that we're looking at right here. So imagine now a request comes in to the organizations page and it's the first request, right? And Laravel says, yeah, okay, I know we have a route for organizations and that routes over to the organizations controller. And then it gets a, an inertia response, which is generated from this inertia render call. And that includes the page component name, as well as any data that's required for that page. Now, normally what would happen is this response would just go back to the browser. It would get rendered right here. And then inertia would boot. It would grab the page data from the data page attribute in the root div for the app. And it would boot, you know, it would boot the app just like it always does. Except when we're doing this in SSR, there's an in-between step. Before inertia actually returns the response back to the browser, let's it, Laravel kind of take control and run with that. It first takes the page object that it's generated here and it fires it off to that background process, that node process, which is this SSR.js file. That then gets the page and it's able to go off and completely render all of that stuff in the background and return HTML back to inertia. Inertia is able to then add that HTML as part of the response and it shows up right in this empty div right here. And that's what makes this whole thing work. So that's how we have, that's how we've gotten server-side rendering to work. And then after the initial page render, well, then you're back into SPA mode and you don't need to worry about it anymore. So it's really about that initial page visit. So, all right, let's, let's actually try this out. Let's go over to the command line here and let's run node. And it's going to be in our, the public directory in the ssr.js file. That's where the build for this SSR file is. And if we run that, it starts a little server for us and it's port 880. And now if we go back to the browser, and if I've done this right, and I hit refresh here, the page reloads. If we line wrap, you can see here that we're getting all the HTML that's for this page. So if we look here, we can see Acme Corporation. If we look on this page, uh, sure enough, that's that right up there. So all the HTML for this page is now server-side rendering on the fly. Let's take it up a notch here. Let's go ahead. We're gonna go open the dev tools here and we're just gonna straight up disable JavaScript. Okay, so we have a view app here with JavaScript disabled. And we're able now to literally browse from page to page, even though JavaScript's completely disabled and even though, even though this is a fully JavaScript application. So that just shows you like how well this actually works. And if we look over here under the network tab, and pull this up so we can actually see. You can see 27 milliseconds, 67, 32, 31. So it's really, really fast, 20, 28 milliseconds. The organization's page is maybe a little bit slower because there's a bunch of content on there. So that's 62, 52, 45, 36. So it's, it's really fast. Um, and I, I guess for me, when I was first trying to explore this, we were looking at all kinds of different options. And we had like headless Chrome running at one point in the background and running headless Chrome is like super expensive, takes a ton of memory. And we'd, you know, render between like 500 milliseconds and a second, sometimes longer. And it was just like super problematic. And when I was able to figure out how to run an inertia app in both the browser and on node and see these times, I was just like totally, totally thrilled. I was like, this is amazing because these are amazing uh, speeds for uh, like in terms of like, if you have a hundred milliseconds or less response time in your app, or your website, like Google's gonna love you. That's a great response time. So yeah, um, that was kind of like a real, a real awesome moment when I figured out that that would work. So the thing to keep in mind here though, is that you're now essentially building what's called an isomorphic app. You're building an app that needs to be able to run in the browser, and it also needs to be able to run in Node. And in some ways that's like a little bit scary and intimidating, at least it was for me. I'm like, well, I don't know what that takes. Is that hard? Sounds complicated. But in reality, it's, it's not that hard. Like I got ping CRM converted pretty easily. Um, the most challenging part really was just plugins that I used. 
Um, certain JavaScript libraries are, you know, they kind of have no concept of SSR. But with other frameworks like Nuxt and Next.js becoming more uh, popular, the idea of server-side rendering, like as a default, is becoming totally common. So uh, JavaScript frameworks and libraries, it's it's more it's more common that they just work in SSR mode out of the box these days. You just got to kind of like keep a like just kind of be aware of it. You don't you got to be careful where you reference the window object or the document object. Um, and most of that time, that's not even an issue because quite often, say you have an event listener, right? That you want to create an event listener on a page to to do something, and you say like document dot add event listener, whatever it is. Um, you often will do that in a, a lifecycle hook, like an on mounted or whatever. And a lot of the lifecycle hooks actually don't run in SSR mode. There's only like two, I think maybe created in one other that run in SSR mode. So a lot of that stuff, as long as you're doing that browser stuff in the, the right lifecycle hooks, you kind of don't run into these issues at all. So that's, that's kind of just kind of like a gotcha that you got to be aware of You're, you, you need to build an isomorphic app. So um, the other kind of nice benefit, if we enable JavaScript here that you should just be aware of is when, again, like the first request, it's an SSR request. And then after that, because the page is loaded, because all the JavaScript is loaded, you now then go into SPA mode, right? And all your visits are made over XHR. But on that first visit, what happens is inertia actually tells, is able to tell view that it's been server-side rendering, sorry, server-side rendered. And what Vue is then able to do is to take advantage of something called client-side hydration. And that basically just means that Vue says, hey, I don't need to like generate all this HTML again in the browser on the first load because you told me that the server actually already generated it and it's already there. So all, all that Vue needs to do is essentially what they call hydrate that HTML and make it reactive or you know um, active, however you want to call that. So that's kind of another little like performance benefit that you just get out of the box with this approach. The other awesome thing about this approach is this, this doesn't require some sort of like SSR build step ahead of time. It's not like we're like pre-compiling templates during a build step. This is all happening in real time. And that means it doesn't only work for public websites. It also works for authenticated applications like ping CRM. So I'm logged in as John Doe right now. And because every one of these requests, because the SSR stage where it actually converts the page to HTML happens really late kind of in the request life cycle, like all this, all, all the authentication stuff all still works and you can generate private HTML that's meant, you know, just for that particular user. So being able to do that, you don't have, like, there's no caching involved here. It just works. It's on the fly. It's automatic. So it really feels in a lot of ways, like you're just working with blade templates because it's doing it on the fly. So the other neat thing that falls out of this as well is some testing changes. And this is not something that we've had a ton of time to explore yet, but I'm really excited about what's possible here. So let me just jump over to the editor here again, and I'm going to open my tests. I'm going to go to my organization's test. I'm going to just jump down here to the very first test. And this one's called test can view organizations. And that's just testing that this page essentially gets the correct data from Laravel. And we're using this assert inertia helper, which is this really handy helper that we added to the, uh, to the library uh, a while back that allows us to make like these really nice assertions in this like really nice fluent API sort of way against the data that's coming back from the controller. The only issue with this approach is that all we're able to verify in this endpoint test is that Laravel and inertia on the Laravel, like kind of on the server side, is returning the correct data. We don't actually get confidence that on the view side, the page component is actually rendering the HTML the way we expect and displaying the content the way we expect. And of course, there's ways to, to get around that. You can use tools like Jest to actually run tests against your view components. You can use tools like Laravel Dusk or Cypress to do like full end-to-end -end tests in the browser. So there is ways to get confidence and to run those kind of tests. But to me, I think this is like just as a Laravel developer, to be able to just have my Laravel application work alongside this node process to generate the HTML on the fly and then allow me in my tests to run assertions against it is really, really interesting. So check this out. I'm going to get rid of this whole section here, but you can see here that we're checking on this page for two companies, Apple and Microsoft. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy those and we're just gonna get rid of this whole entire assertion. And then I'm gonna use just the good old fashioned 
a cert C helper that Laravel ships with. We're just going to say a cert C that Apple's on the page. And we're going to cert C that Microsoft's on the page. And then we'll assert that we don't see who we're going to pick on. We'll go with Yahoo. Okay. So this is like a way simpler test, right? But still like a ton of confidence here uh, being provided with this test if it works. So, and then I'm going to jump over to the command line and I'm going to open a new tab here. I'm going to run this test. And you can see here that sure enough, three assertions passed. And I don't know. I just think that this is really, really cool because what we're actually getting here is we're able to run assertions against the HTML. I'll dump that out here. And you can see here, this is all the HTML that's being generated. And you can see how fast it is as well. So what this means basically is within our PHP unit test suite, we're able to get confidence that our JavaScript framework is actually rendering the HTML properly and we're able to run assertions against it. And we've already only sort of scratched the surface of this because I think there's like some other interesting and opportunities here. For instance, Vue in, in SSR mode, if you make a mistake, but not enough to like crash the SSR mode entirely, it'll like generate warnings. And I think that we can capture those warnings and return those back to the testing framework so that we can have the test fail, even if we're getting warnings to just really help you know, help us be confident that when we're making changes to our applications, especially like on the, on the view side and the page components that our tests all still pass properly. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of this and the next area that I want to explore. And I'm really, really excited about what's possible there. Because to be honest, I, I really don't like working with uh, browser end to end tests like uh, Cypress or Dusk, as cool as those are. And as much as they have their place, they feel very heavy and very clunky. It's just way nice to be able to run my PHP test suite. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about briefly here is another important component of this, this whole SSR setup, and that is the head component. So when I first got going on the whole SSR feature and I started getting a prototype working, uh, Claudio Decker, who helps with the Inertia project, jumped in and started helping on the Inertia head component. So I'm gonna to go to the organizations, organization slash index page here, and you can see on this page that we have this head component. So this is included with inertia. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to set head elements. So this is like a, a short, like a short form where you just set the page title, but you can also set stuff like meta tags for, for whatever you want, like a meta description tag or Twitter, Twitter cards or Facebook open graph tags or whatever they're called. You can do all of that stuff with the inertia head component. And that's great because in the browser, we're able to like dynamically swap this. We're like literally like making DOM changes as the head component gets rendered from page to page. And that's what gives us these nice updates as we navigate through an inertia app. But the thing about it is we don't have a DOM and we don't have the browser when we're rendering in node. So this component was designed from day one to also run in SSR. So what happens is in SSR mode, what this component does is actually keeps track of all the elements that are meant to be rendered in the head. And then when that comes back from the SSR uh, web server, we're able on the Laravel side to take all those elements and then render them in our root template. So you can see here that we're on the organizations page. You can see that sure enough, we're getting the title rendered out here. And if we go to that, the dashboard page, we're getting the dashboard rendered there. And of course, if we had meta tags and other things like that, they would be rendered here as well. So this is like really, really important from a, an SEO perspective where SEO relies heavily on having proper title tags and meta description tags and everything else. So this is like a really key part of this whole SSR feature that I'm just really stoked with how well that turned out. Claudio did an awesome job with that. Okay, so that's it for SSR. You're probably wondering when is it gonna be released? It's an open access, early access right now. Uh, and it's probably going to be in early access for just a little bit longer because we're trying to finalize just a few last little things in particular around the build step for the SSR.js file. It's a bit clunky right now. And I'm hoping that we can make some tweaks to Laravel Mix to make that a little bit easier. Outside of that, we're gonna write some documentation. And uh, yeah, once that's done, I think it will be uh, become publicly available. My goal is before the end of the year, uh, but it might even be earlier than that. So stay tuned for SSR. And if you do want SSR today, it is available uh, in early access uh, and the minimum cost for that is $15 a month. Okay, on to the next topic, dialogues.
Uh, let's go to the contacts page. All right, so dialogues are, this feature is much earlier on in development, uh, but I'm also like really, really excited about this because this is like a pain point that I've really personally felt a lot in my own applications um, that I just think that once this is done, it's just going to make developing and working with modals just so, so much better. Uh, if you're wondering why the feature is called dialogues and not modals, it's because I think dialogues like the more generic term uh, and there's an actual dialogue element that's in the process of being added to browsers. So we kind of match that name. And uh, someday we might even be able to use dial the dialogue component along with the dialogue uh, feature in Inertia because this is really just uh, the component that actually renders whatever it is that you want to show, which Inertia doesn't have a lot of preference around. You can kind of render whatever modal or dialogue you want. So I'm looking forward to having first class browser support for that. All right. So I want to start by just talking a little bit about how I've made modals in the past. And I think probably a lot of you have done something similar to what I do. So I actually have this contacts page set up with a the create page set up as a modal. And this is like pretty standard. You click the modal, it opens, you click outside of it, it closes the modal and, and that's good. Like it works, it's got a form, you can submit, handle errors, you know, everything else, that's all, that's all good. But there's kind of a lot of issues actually with this setup. Um, and I'm gonna step through each one of them here just to kind of like make sure you're clear on the drawbacks to this approach. The first one is I don't have an endpoint. I don't have a contact slash create endpoint that I can then share with someone that will directly open this modal on this page. Uh, doesn't exist. Um, the other issue is that modals don't have any uh, history state. So the, when you create it this way, right? And maybe I should show you for a second what this actually looks like on, I'm gonna go to the contact slash index page, which is this one right here. If I go down to the create button here, you can see how I've got this implemented. I have this create contact modal that exists within this template. So I'm actually importing this component into the index page. And then I have some local state called show create modal that keeps track of whether or not the modal should be open or closed at any given point. And when we click the button, this button right here, it opens the modal. And when we, uh, and then that the modal component uh, has a callback or an event that says if it closes, meaning like I click outside of it, well, then we set the show create modal uh, local state to false. So using local state in this way is like a very, very typical way of handling modals. So again, the problem, they don't have a create endpoint. They don't have their own endpoint. And the other issue is they don't have any history state. So if I'm like browsing through this app, right? And I end up on the contacts page and I wanna create a contact and then I go back, you might expect that I would land on the contacts page, but I actually end up on the organizations page. And that's because I never actually left the contacts page. I simply showed this modal on top of that. And the same goes the other way, right? Like if I go back and I go forward, it doesn't reopen it. So that's kind of like not a great experience. Another kind of like annoying issue is that modals really don't have their own endpoint in the app, meaning they any data that needs to be loaded for them needs to be done kind of through this in-between page. So if we go to the contacts controller in our app, contacts controller, we look at the index method here, you can see that it's rendering the index page here, but down at the bottom, and it's, you can see all the contact info that's rendering on the con, you know, all the contacts it's showing. But then we've got this organizations list here. Now this page doesn't actually use these organizations at all. Those organizations are used on the create contact modal for this select dropdown right here. So this is like kind of this annoying thing because we have this prop for organizations. If we go in here, when we look at the props, we can see on the index page, we have this organizations prop that then gets passed as a prop, you know, to the create contact modal so that that create contact modal can render them in the select. So it's kind of nasty, right? It's like the, the contact index page needs to know about this, this stuff that's really nothing to do with it. It just, it needs to know about it because it has to be able to pass it through to the modal. So I don't, I don't really like that. And then kind of like a related problem because of this like really tight coupling between the contact index page and the create contact dialogue, um, the, the, the dialogue and the modal can only be shown on this page. If we wanted to say, have a button on the dashboard that says create cut and like a little create contact, like a little shortcut button, there's no easy way to like add that right now. We'd literally have to load the organization's data on the dashboard in the dashboard controller. We then have to import the create contact modal onto the dashboard and kind of go through that whole same hoopla with a local state and everything else. 
And it just, it just feels like, it just feels kind of like garbage. It's like, it, there's gotta be a better way. So, and that's really what we set out to try to improve with the inertia dialogue feature. And I think we've landed on something that's really, really awesome. So let me show you how it works. All right. Let's, uh, let's go over. Actually, the first thing I need to do, I'm going to clear some of this stuff out, clear this watcher. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run yarn link add inertia JS slash inertia and inertia view three. So the dialogue stuff hasn't been published yet. So all I'm doing here is lo uh, linking my local copies of these libraries where the dialogue stuff has been added. And then I'll just start my watcher again, npm run watch. Okay, so let's think about what we got to do here. The first thing we want to do is we want to actually create a route for the contact slash create endpoint. So let's do that. Let's go over to our app and we know how to do that, right? We're Laravel developers. We go to route slash web, and then we create a create endpoint. And I've actually already stubbed this one in just for the interest of time. So contacts slash create, and that's going to point to the contacts controller and the create method. Pretty standard layer of all stuff. But it's worth noting already at this point that because it's getting its own endpoint, it can now have its own middleware. It can now have its own uh, permissions, kind of everything that comes along with a, a, an endpoint and all the tooling around that in Laravel just kind of comes for free. So keep that in mind as kind of as we go here. Let's go to the contract contacts controller now. And right before the store method, let's create a new, let's create a new method for this, the create method. And we are going to return inertia and render, but except we're not going to use render. So inertia render is normally what you, we use here. But instead, I'm going to use this new dialog method. And it's exactly the same as inertia render, except it's designed to tell inertia that this response is a dialog response. And we'll give it a component just like we do always. So contact slash create. And we can also give it data. So I'm going to go ahead and steal this organization's data that the index really doesn't need. And I'm going to come down here and paste this into our new create endpoint. And now that's literally all we need to get things set up for this endpoint on the server side. So we do need to make a couple of changes on the client side to kind of get this all working properly. Mostly what we need to do is we just need to get the, this dialogue out of the contact index page. So let's do that. Let's go down here and where we import that con the create contact modal, we'll remove that from there. We'll remove it from the component registration and we'll remove the prop that gets registered. And we'll go up to the top oh, right here. Oh, we can also get rid of this component state, right? We don't need that anymore to check whether the modal is open or not anymore. And then we'll get rid of the modal from the template, remove it, all kinds of stuff here. Okay. Get rid of this uh, click handler to check, to set the open state. And then we're going to change this button from being a button to just a good old fashioned inertia link. And we're going to set that href to contact slash create. Now think about what's happening here to open this dialogue. Now, all we need to do is linked to it. That's it. Nothing more than that. This component doesn't have to know anything more about this dialogue other than the fact that that dialogue lives at slash contacts slash create. So the only other quick change I need to make here is I need to update the actual dialogue component. And we just need to remove this jazz here that handles the manual handling of whether or not to show or close the modal. And that's because we don't need to handle that anymore. Uh, because inertia is now handling that for us. Inertia will decide when this modal or this dialogue should be open and it'll decide when it should be closed. Okay, I think that's all we need. If I haven't done anything wrong here, we should be able to go to the browser, reload this page, that'll refresh the assets. And I'm gonna just open the dev tools here. And if you see here, you know, if we hover over this, we can see that the link is contact slash create. And if we click on that, sure enough, the dialogue opens. Okay, so a few things here. First, you can see that we hit the slash contact slash create endpoint, and that's now the endpoint that we're on. And you can see that we got an inertia response back, and you can see that it has this type set to dialogue. So that's how inertia on the client side knows that this is a dialogue. The other really interesting thing is how this actually gets rendered server side. So if we go to the view dev tools here, we can see that we have our base layouts, so our whole layout, and the page within that layout, so our index page, that is actually a sibling to the create 
contact dialogue. So this is really important, actually, the fact that these get rendered as siblings, because quite often, if you've ever built modals in the past, you can run into like styling issues where the styles from the app like leak into your modal. And the, the, the kind of the standard way of solving that is you use portals or teleport in view three to actually render the dialogue in a different place in the DOM. So uh, typically at the root, kind of within the top level of the body. So you don't need to worry about any of that with the inertia dialogue feature because we do that automatically for you. We just render these two sections as siblings. So that's just something that you don't even need to think about, which I think is really cool. So the other thing you get here, so if I close the dev tools, is you get history state. So I can go back in history and I can go forward in history. And again, like this all just falls kind of into the standard uh, inertia routing layer. So this is just like, you kind of get it for free now. So the other really cool thing that you get is this thing that I was talking about. It's like, what happens if we wanted to put this dialogue on another page? So this contact page here, really, it, it's not special anymore. So we could go and grab that link that we created on the, on the contacts page. Let's go to the dashboard page for a sec. And let's just add it there. It's just a plain old inertia link. And now we go over there and it's been added to that page and hit create contact. Oops, I didn't let it fully re-render. They were still building. Let me do that again. Hit create contact. And sure enough, that dialogue opens on that page. Okay, so I think that's pretty sweet because basically now we don't have to worry about the dialogue at all from the dashboard page or the contact page. Both of these pages can just kind of be oblivious. All they, can, all they think about is, hey, I want to link to it or not. The data for that dialogue is now all handled within that specific endpoint for it. And the um, meaning we can add it wherever we want and we can make this as optimized as we need specifically for the needs of that dialogue. So let me show you one last thing that was the trickiest piece of all this to kind of solve and that like when I, Figured this out. This was kind of when I was like, okay, yes, I think this dialogue feature is at the point that I, we can actually release it. So what we've been talking about all along is like one of the main benefits of this is it has its own endpoint, right? So it has its own URL. So in theory, we should be able to send people directly to this endpoint. We should be able to give people a link directly to this page and they should be able to go there. But what do you think would happen right now if we went here? And we actually already saw it a second ago when I didn't wait for the build to happen properly we get this really weird state. We get our dialogue rendered, but in the background, we just got this white background and then we got the dialogue kind of like 50% overlay on top of it. So what we have here is we, it, it kind of makes sense. We got our page, but we didn't get any of the context. We didn't get the app. We didn't get the layout or anything like that. And this was something that I really like didn't know how to solve for a long time. Because if you think about it, in this state right here, this isn't, when we're on the create contact page here, this isn't really like a single request that made this state. What actually happened is we went into our app, we hit the contacts page, which made a request to the server, returned the contacts page in the layout, and then we made a second request to actually show the dialogue. But like this page here, if we visit it directly, well, it's only making one of those requests. It's only making the dialogues request. It's not making the request to the layout and the page behind it. So this like really had me stumped and I was trying to think of all kinds of creative ways to solve this. Like could the create contact dialogue somehow extend, you know, the, the contact page and you know, what would that look like? But you know, you get this nasty coupling between the two and, and the problem is we actually need to get all the data for this page. So we need to hit the contacts uh, endpoint because we have to get the data for it. And technically I'd love it to run through the middleware and all the permissions and everything else. But then we also need to actually hit the endpoint for the create contact. So I'm like, how do we do this? And kind of right around the time that I was thinking through this, uh, Taylor was working on Octane for Laravel. And he had kind of come up with this system where you could have Laravel running kind of as a long running process, but that like as requests come through, Laravel would just like within like the framework would like fire off subsequent requests like internally within the framework to other endpoints within, within that application. And that was kind of like the aha light bulb moment for me with how to solve this. Yes, we want this initial request to come through and hit the contacts create endpoint and run through that middleware and everything else. But what we were able to do is to get inertia and Laravel to say, hey, 
we actually need a background page here as well. So fire off another request, not an actual request, like it's an internal request that's super fast. It's just run within the framework itself and actually hit the contacts page or whatever page we want to show in the background and get the page object so inertia can render that alongside this dialogue. So when we got this working, oh, I was that was a good, good day. So let me just show you how this actually works. So this there's this little problem, this little method that you can chain onto the dialogue option that allows you to set the base page route. And you can set this to whatever you want. And in our case, we'll set it to the contacts page because this is kind of like a sensible page to show in the background. And we'll just set that to contacts because that's the name of the route. You can also do things like set it to the URL if you want to, if you're not using route, uh, route names, but I'm just going to use the route name in this situation. So now inertia is aware of what page to display in the background. And if we go back to here now and we hit refresh, we can see that that page is fully rendered in the background for us. And not only is it rendered in the background, inertia is aware of it so that when we close to this dialogue, it knows that we need to actually go to the contacts page and not some other page. And of course, history state here works and everything else as well. So that was a really, really cool moment uh, when we figured out that we could render two pages at the same time. And, and obviously that doesn't matter once you're in SPA mode browsing the app, but it's very, very important on that initial page visit. So I really wanted that experience to be awesome. And I was really happy we came up with this solution. And the other thing that's really cool with this solution is that because Inertia is aware of both the background page object and has all the data for it, as well as the dialogue page object and has all the data for it, we're able to send both of those to the SSR server and it can actually server-side render both of the pages and return the HTML in a full sort of like just one pass back to the server or back to the browser on that initial page visit. So this feature will work in SSR as well, which I'm just like super stoked about. Okay, I'm probably going a little over time here. I'm sorry about that, Ian, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that was a, a good introduction to the SSR features in Inertia, as well as the new dialogue component. I'm not totally sure when the dialogue component or uh, the dialogue feature is gonna be available for Inertia. Could be a little while yet. There's a lot of like tricky edge cases that me and Claudio have been working through on that. Um, but I'm really optimistic about this feature and I think it's just going to like, it's going to like totally change the way that I, I build applications that have dialogues and modals. Cause it's just, it just feels so much more like how you build normal endpoints in a Laravel application. So that's it. That's all I got. Thanks everyone for listening to my talk today and for your interest in inertia and for everyone else that supports the project. It means a ton to me and it's uh, been really fun being back here this year to, uh, to give this talk. So back to you, Ian. All right. Thanks a lot. Great job. That's really cool stuff. <laughs> Pretty wild, actually. Just be honest, Ian. You hate JavaScript and you want nothing to do with it. It's starting to get closer. So you get the server side rendering again. Yeah, it's like yeah. we're, we're getting back to the I might be able to pull you in, eh? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. Later.